I need some traction. Generative AI is all the rage these days. I can't open my LinkedIn without scrolling through dozens and dozens of posts and carousels on the topic. Thousands of generative AI tools just swarming the market. And VC funding for generative AI startups have exploded with two and a half billion in funding last year. But regardless of the hype, generative AI has the power to transform the way we do business and reshape the entire customer journey. And we're not just talking about looking at old data and improving it a little bit. We're talking about rebuilding the future today. And I'm excited to interview one of the pioneers in the space, one of the smartest product people I know, Des Trainer, co-founder, chief strategy officer, and board member at Intercom. Des at Intercom covers many areas, leading R&D, product, engineering, and design. He's also a renowned speaker, blogger, and a visionary on product strategy. If you don't already do, check out his blog. Phenomenal insights. And he frequently represents Intercom when speaking at international conferences. He's been to Traction a couple of times already. Plus, he's an active angel investor in more than 50 startups with breakout successes like Stripe, Notion, and Miro. So Des is going to demystify the most popular buzzword of 2023 for us. Welcome back to Traction, Des. How are you doing? Doing very well, Lloyd. Thank you. That's quite an intro. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> You're more than living up to it. You know, it's funny. Um, in 2013, I was working on a startup called Automatically, which was a chatbot built on top of Zendesk to offer like basically look at historical data and respond like real humans. And being the arrogant engineers that we were, we couldn't get it to work because Zendesk customers were so small, they didn't have historical data. And so it was spitting out gibberish. And we tried for a while and people were like, make this stop. So we made it editor approved, but but they're like, we're editing the whole sentence. And so we gave it up. If I knew uh, then what I know today, I would have just done a decision tree. But then came along Intercom and I'm like, hey, you guys solved the problem we set out to solve. And, and now you've taken it further. So excited, excited to see uh, what you guys are working on. But, you know, it's the hottest buzzword of 2023. I'm using it every day. Most people are using it every day. Um, everyone, including VCs, seem to have gone from blockchain and crypto experts to Gen AI experts. What's your take? Let's dive into the tech and the landscape around this AI shit. Yeah, my take, I mean... So I do want to offer like, you know, some of my best friends are VCs, et cetera. So, but I do want to offer one comforting word, which is like, I, I, it is true that like two years ago, everyone was like talking about Web3 or blockchain or crypto or whatever, and now they're all talking about AI. But also that is the kind of job of a VC to like, to jump into new areas and very quickly familiarize yourself with what the hell is going on, understand the trends and make bets. That's like literally the gig. So like we should, we should not be too surprised when a new technology emerges and they become overnight experts because like not i'm not going to say that they actually are full experts but but you know did they back their entire opinion up with like tens of millions of dollars uh granted up with people's money uh to uh to uh, sort of find winners so it doesn't surprise me and i think it's okay that, that like that they uh, aim to gather a lot of expertise very quickly i think what's so to the higher level question what's going on the way i just think about it is um you know for the longest time, AI was this mythical thing that we weren't sure we were ever going to see really come to fruition. I think there was early warnings out of OpenAI that they were going to do something pretty cool, maybe as far back as like two years ago. Uh, I think uh, once they launched the playground where you could actually just interact with text and it could do some pretty smart stuff, that was pretty uh, impressive. Then Dolly was obviously pretty impressive from an entirely different angle. And then obviously November 30th, I think it was, ChatGPT dropped. And I basically want to say like the whole world from a technological perspective changed overnight. And certainly that was, you know, the closest thing we would have in Intercom to like a code red type scenario of like, hey, uh, some of the fundamental assumptions about our business, about what our customers want to do, have been uh, irreparably and like and massively changed based on what is now technically possible. So we, you know, we have to get to work on that. I think like when I take a step back and look at the actual trend or like maybe like, the, you know, what's been happening, I don't think it's hype. I don't think it's bluster. I think some people, uh, specifically like professional Twitter commentators who like do, you know, 
like soft boy sync fluencer treads are like they're tempted to just try and like pile on and AI is going to write like this and it's going to do that. I think uh, oftentimes I feel like I feel like I want to correct them and say that's not yet technically possible. But my corrections are largely academic because like five weeks later it will be possible or whatever. So um, so but but I, I do still think like like what is like literally live and available today is groundbreakingly different. You know, uh, it's it's bigger than mobile. It's bigger than the cloud. It's bigger than Web two. Obviously, bigger than Web three. Um, and I just I so I think like you know I think what is live today checks all those boxes. So it actually doesn't need any further hype on top. However, it is also not only is it a breakthrough period, but the rate of progress at the moment is so astounding. Uh, like the new capabilities, even like with the say most recent the plugins that OpenAI released, uh, even that alone is just like another just like another um, orthogonal uh, dimension of power that is now possible. When we all thought like we were all happy and impressed with like just ChatGPT, but it just keeps going in different directions. And uh, so I, I think like no, you know to give my sort of take on it, I think this will be uh, the single biggest disruptive layer to the, the startup and generally the software ecosystem that we have seen in my lifetime, perhaps, you know, it's, it's maybe as, it's as big as the internet. Um, but it's definitely like, it's definitely somewhere bigger than mobile. Uh, and cause it affects not just startups, but it affects the real world too. Like it's like, it's, you don't have to be a professional internet person to be dramatically affected by what has happened. Um, and I think, uh, I think every product category, whatever your software does, is going to shift in a huge way, either because AI can do the tasks that the software exists to do. So, for example, like find the meaning in this data or whatever, right? That used to be like 27 mouse clicks and five Tableau dropdowns and a load of SQL. Now you just ask a pretty dumb question, like what's going on in this data set or what are the abnormalities? And it answers them. But even... If it's not a direct application of AI, I also think interface design and like how people engage with software will change. And I think there's evidence of this. We're seeing like say Dharmesh Shah from HubSpot. He's been building a tool, hacking away on a tool called Chatspot, uh, which is basically a tech, plain text interface to HubSpot and a few other tools. But what to me, like what's obvious there is uh, one of the things that this the large language models have made possible is the idea that if you simply know the thing you want to know, so if you if you understand the thing you're trying to do, you can literally just explain it in English and it will get done. So to give you a very simple example, and I'll, I'll hand back to you, um, a lot of us uh, have Google Analytics on our website. Most of us don't really have a clue how to use Google Analytics properly. Um, so if you said to me, hey, Des, Find Intercom's biggest refer that ends in co.uk and sent us the most traffic in March. Like, I know that that's technically possible in GA. I also know it could take me approximately two to three hours to actually get that done. Uh, but in a world where Google Analytics has embraced the LLM style, like plain text interface, I would just type the thing I'm trying to do and it would just go and do it for me. And what that, that isn't just an optimization for the deses of the world. That means all of a sudden, overnight, everyone's a Google Analytics user. Everyone's an expert. So it totally changes the addressable market. And the sort of the fundamental nature of product categories is now so much bigger. And uh, like uh, like it comes back to this idea of if you can think it and you can explain what it is you're trying to do, it can be done. And that is just, that's a step change uh, for like productivity and honestly for society. So if that's not enough hype, I can add some more, but I'll, I'll hand back to you and see where you want to go. You know, that is perfectly said, right? You hit the nail on the head there. Because historically, people have built large businesses by selling crappy software just on the virtue of it's must needed, right? And then it spawns this whole cottage industry of consultants who teach you how to use it. Now, not everyone are engineers like you and me, right? And so they now need to make sense of this, but they don't even know where to start. Even Google Analytics, as great of a tool as it is, it's not usable. And and even like you know the Google Keyword Tool and so on, things change names, and and people don't know, and it's it's not as usable. 
And and you guys had a very early thesis on chat UI as an interface, and you must be laughing as you see that taking over the world because, man, if anyone can just talk to it and get the answer they want, then truly it increases the addressable market for every piece of software. And and so then software that have historically been built on, hey, you know what? Let's be sticky by virtue of just being painful will cease to exist. Absolutely. And then there's a, there's a second order effect, which is if you can describe what your actual job is, uh, you can just ask somebody to do it for you. So, so like one order of this is just, yeah, you can, if you can explain it, like, you know, uh, how to, like a classic, let, let's say even AdWord optimization tool, right? just picking a random off the shelf idea. Uh, you could imagine one version of this being like, hey, uh, dear AdWord optimization tool, uh, you'd say, find me my most performant ads uh, and and put all the spend into them and run 100 variations of them with slightly different words and then please re-optimize or something like that, right? Again, this is something that like would otherwise be a lot of a lot of mouse clicks, a lot of drop downs, and a lot of like copywriting tweaks to do. But it can now be kind of done. Uh, and then if you just take one step back and be like, what if you say, hey GPT, I want you to log in every day and run the following checks uh see what's working what's not turn off the ads that aren't working turn on the ones that are uh re-optimize produce multiple uh, variations look at our product launch feature list here's the url if we've uh, launched anything new run ads for that as well turn them off if they don't work if you can articulate your job uh then all of a sudden you start to ask yourself what does the interface for that product look like right it's because you've literally said hey Here's everything I want you to do. Go do it. Nearly to a point of like, you know, and you could add on like an email me a performance report every Monday or something like that, you know. Uh, but like when you get there, you start to realize the, the very nature of like what, what software is and what it does and how humans interact with it entirely changes. You know, and like the, there are so many jobs in the world that exist to use software to like look at performance metrics or to like see who's working, what shift and what errors or whatever. And now if we can describe the job, it can be done. And like that has like, that has, like the repercussions of that are like are still uh, to be seen. But I just, I, I can't help but like, uh, but think that like, we're, we're still not fully gripping what's possible. And you know, the familiarity of the interface makes people more likely to use it, right? Almost everybody I know with a mobile phone their first, first mode of communication is a chat interface, whether it's WhatsApp, yes. whether, whether it's Telegram, whether it's Discord, and then for business, it goes in an intercom or Slack. Whatever, and yeah. so yeah, yeah. they're already familiar with it. And so then for me, eventually I spend like 80% of my relationships, my conversations on chat, not phone, yeah. not email, 80% yeah. on chat. And now that I got to log into this clunky piece of software and, and click and so on, and if everything had a chat interface, it just changes the game. It gets more people to adopt your software. And a long time ago, we had this chat on onboarding, onboarding being the leading indicator of engagement and retention. I mean, what better way to onboard people than have an interface like that? Oh, totally. And, and then one other thing that we're, again, will have repercussions is, so like generally speaking, we're, we're saying like, people can type faster than they can write with a pen and paper, right? Um, but they can talk faster than they can type. These are all just different modalities, right? And uh, and generally speaking, the the gap becomes uh, like if you say if you measure the gap between the thought and the uh, expression of the thought. So going back to our Google Analytics example, hmm, I wonder what traffic is working in the or what ads are working in the UK. Like you can have that thought in a second, and it can be like two hour of feedback loop before you get your answer. With a text driven UI, it's going to be a lot shorter. Uh, but with a voice driven UI, it's going to be a lot shorter again. And OpenAI have also fired out like uh, Whisper, their uh, their like real time audio transcription. And then on the other side, you have companies like either uh, Synthesia or Sonantic or Papercup or whatever, who are doing lots of really impressive stuff in the generative voice technology space. So you can literally imagine like the, that movie with ScarJo, um, her, where she's like a digital assistant to him. Like we're we're very close to that, uh, and we're not far off things like. Hey, work today. Please book a two week vacation for me on August 1st. Or like, you know, you know, in some like even more optimistic world, 
uh, there'll be some sort of Zapier plugin to work there that's triggered by your Google Calendar or something like that, you know. Uh, but like very, very quickly, you end up uh, basically just talking to computers and hearing things back. Or if you're, uh, you know, if you're like whatever in a library or an office, maybe you're typing. But I just think we're going to end up with multimodal input, input and output. So when I'm driving, I'll be talking to software and getting audio back, and it all feels great. Like, hey, uh, Intercom, what are my most pressing issues in customer support today? And Intercom will reply back in, in Intercom's tone of voice to say to answer that question. And then if I step into, I don't know, a library or an office. I can carry on the conversation by taking my phone and just typing away. And I just think that's going to be where software is going to go, like this uh, multimodal, like sort of uh, mixed method communication between like people and, and software and people and people, but that's uh, different again. But yeah, so I, I just think this is what's happening. Um, and if your sort of roadmap is clinging desperately to the idea that this disruption won't affect you, I don't really see much hope for you. I'm a big proponent of chat UI. You know, what's funny is uh, in 2013, when we were building automatically, we hadn't even heard of Intercom and we built uh, a chat UI right in the right side of Zendesk. And then we could never get it to work. But then when Intercom came, of course, we used it at Speakeasy and yeah. became a user. But um, at the next company. And, and so I've been a long proponent of this, but this also proves one very fundamental uh, product principle. Customers don't want software. They don't want outcomes. I don't sign up to the gym to just go and push some, you know, some weights. I go there to get a six pack. I don't sign up for a marketing automation tool just to click some clicks and knobs. I go there to get more leads. And for the longest time, technology was making you do work to get the outcome. And we're in an age where an interface and a tectonic shift will help you get the outcome without clicking and, and pushing knobs and buttons. So that is the most exciting thing for me here. Yeah, that is very correct. I think uh, that's the right way to approach the roadmap, which is customers come to you with a desired outcome or a job to be done, a, a certain state they want to get to. And I think like the right way to build the software from this point forward, I think, will be to say, what is their desired endpoint? And they might say, like, I want to be running an optimized ads campaign, or I want to be kept aware of all my projects and if they're running on time or whatever. And then the only question you have to ask is, what further information or decision points do we definitely need the human for here? And that's like ultimately like, that becomes like, where, where will the AI not yet work reliably, right? So as in, it probably can't read like every single JIRA ticket and story and make the right accurate inferences and reprioritize the robot. It's probably not there yet because there's still stuff in humans' heads that Jira didn't capture or whatever, like as in there might be knowledge that hasn't been transcribed or there might be a uh, decision logic that had, that the AI can't faithfully replicate. Uh, but I, I, I think the right way to start is let's assume if the user could, they would just express the thing they're trying to get done, press return and walk away. They've, they don't care about your gradients, your fancy buttons, your beautiful drop downs, your typography. They don't give a single shit. They just want to be able to say, here's the thing I want to get done, return and walk away. And the only reason you should come back to them for more information is because you're either looking for further context or decision logic that you haven't already caught somewhere else. And like that's like that is the future sort of software design method. I think I could be wrong to be clear. Like, but like, uh, you know, that that's how I see it going. You know, you and I both agree on this. And and for the longest time, I, I think it's almost like everything you know about user experience or you learn in school. You almost have to throw that away and, and reimagine this, right? Like no button, no like optimizing for conversion rate optimization. It's the simplest thing which has the most explosive growth. It's a chat interface. Hey, I need to speak with this type of customer in this geography and I want this, this type of uh, a profile. And then it spits out a CSV. It, it may not have the fanciest interface, like neither is intercom chat or chat GPT. But mm -hmm. it works. It gets the job done. And I think ultimately that's what it is. Make it bring it to its simplest form, but give me an outcome. I don't I don't care about putting lipstick on a pig. I want the outcome. So that is that is great. Now, yeah. What do you think was the single most uh, thing that tipped this? What what caused this shift? Because generative AI uh, is is while it's buzzing right now, it, open AI has been working on it for years. We had access, I'm sure you had access a couple of years ago. 
But AI as an industry, people have been talking about it for 10 plus years. So what changed that caused this huge shift? I mean, technically, I think it was OpenAI training the best large language model uh, on the internet, on the entirety of the internet, effectively, or up until whatever it was, November 2021. I think that was what really enabled this all-knowing thing. Um, but then I do want to give a small shout out to like whoever the designer, specifically the UX designer in uh, who who designed like uh, ChatGPT. Um, because I think there's something uh, there was something initially compelling or addictive about that that experience, right? And, and it's like subtle things. It's like it's the, the the sort of the typed computer output vibe that it comes back with. It's it's a little bit of its subtle sort of tone of voice, um, but it, it made it engaging in a way that like uh, we hadn't seen before. And and whilst clearly being a competitor to Google, they didn't take massive inspiration from Google. But the last thing I think is um, is we haven't really like we're much more used to to deal with computers and specifically from like a search or like task uh, point of view as being stateless like uh like single shot queries so you like if you do a google search and then you do a follow-on search it's not very obvious to the end user how google has like connected the two of them whereas if you say something like find me the best places to eat in downtown dubai it will it, chat gpt will spit them out and you can say oh sorry i meant only vegetarian ones and it will it like it it knows what it adds that to the previous conversation and it comes back with a better answer and then you can say that are open right now and then you can say that like that costs less than 100 but you you can daisy chain your your thinking whereas if you think about how you do that in a, in a google world you're going to end up at yelp or open table and you'll be constantly applying like progressively applying filters but in a very clunky ui way um and i just think like so there's something addictive about like you know that, and I like obviously you know searching for restaurants might seem like an easy one that you know Google or OpenTable could do. But another version of this would be like write me an email, write me a song, write me a story, uh, or like summarize a project. No, pl please be longer. Please, please explicitly refer to people. You know, you can just keep adding this thing in, and and I think that has become a more intimate form of computing where you actually feel like you're having a conversation with the product as opposed to just issuing one single shot commands. Definitely, I think that's that's well said here, and. In terms of use cases, right? We talk about tech quite a bunch, but what are some other use cases or examples of generative AI being used in different industries outside of the startups and, and the software we talked about? I like. I think we you know we are we are so early into this, so we like the answers I would give will be nowhere near complete and will be out of date in like six months. I just, you know, I want to uh, proceed this by saying, like, uh, sort of, you know, uh, GPT Turbo, which is what ChatGPT is built on, and then GPT Four. The like, Turbo, I think, is like three and a half months old, and Four is like, I want to say, six weeks old, five weeks old at this point. So we have yet to see like commercial availability of the best of what's possible, but. Uh, I have seen T-shirt companies. I have seen children's storybooks where you say, "Write me a great story about you know my child called blah." Here's a photo of her, and it can go and use you know Mid Journey style, Dolly style generation to actually build illustrations, and it'll write a story. And whoever the child you fed to it was is the, is a, the main protagonist in the story. Uh, it can do that. And at the end, end of it, you've seen other like um, I guess like maybe they. Uh, Everything is softer in some sense, um, but like, you know, I'd say, obviously we're using it to do customer support, right? we're using it for payments, uh, like to detect fraud or whatever. I like you're going to consistently see anything where like large, uh, like massive data analysis or anything where like a uh, repetitive judgment uh, allocation is applied. You're just going to see those things just get entirely like rewritten from the ground up. So I, I've seen like, you know, the other stuff we have seen, like we've seen uh, AI to generate movies. Uh, we've seen AI to generate music. Uh, we've seen AI to generate obviously, obviously visuals and imagery, and I think you're going to continue to see all of that. The next stuff I suspect, like the next order, I think we'll see is like in the, you know songs and books and movies have a start and an end point. That's for no good reason other than the fact that like you know the directors tapped out or whatever. I think the AI doesn't get tired, so it can you can have like a world that goes forever or a movie that goes forever. 
But they also generally tend to have like just one camera angle. Uh, I think in a world where you're actually generating whole worlds, you can tell a story from multiple different angles and produce multiple different scenes describing the same scenario. Um, I think books like, you know, can be effectively endless. Uh, they can choose your own adventure style. Books will have a whole different uh, meaning when, uh, when there's AI involved. I just, you know, I think most art forms are going to change uh, in, well, not change, but like, there'll be new types of art forms added to what we currently have uh, across everything from like art all the way through to music, sound, uh, movie, theater, you name it. Fantastic. You know, I've been playing with Mid Journey quite a bit for, you know, tattoos and designs and all kinds of things, t-shirt designs. So definitely epic and we haven't seen the end of it, but I am really bullish on on the whole chat interface and you talk to something and say, give me just this. And it specifically spits that out. Now, what does it mean? I mean, uh, let's shift to intercom a little bit. What are you guys doing and what does it mean for customers and their interactions with brands? Like how can it be used to create personalized experiences and drive this, this loyalty, which, you know, for the longest time, customer service has, you know, although with all the tools and everything else, Still, it leaves a lot more to be desired, right? Because it's still in the hands of humans to to cause the interaction. Yeah. So I think there's a few different things here. Um, most support teams are under extreme pressure. Uh, they're under extreme pressure because oftentimes businesses, uh, you know, devalue support and see it as a cost center. So they try to work at what's the minimum we can get away with, as opposed to what's the most we can do. Uh, so I think, you generally speaking, any given customer support team. If you ask them, like, "Hey, uh, how how are you staffed relative to your caseload?" They'll say they're you know they're under pressure, under extreme pressure. Uh, and then obviously, like things like layoffs affect that. Things like you know the kind of the grand digitization caused by COVID have like increased the, the load, etc. Um, so, what can change, and how can we how can we make this a better experience for all? Well, the first, when GPT launched, uh, sorry, when GPT, ChatGPT launched, the first thing we did was we started to work getaway uh, because of the it, early on. You might recall it was like an hallucination problem where, uh, like, the if the if the intelligence didn't know, it would just make shit up, and uh, and that's obviously risky from a customer support point of view. So what we figured we could do would be uh, agent assist. So our first release in the space was in uh, late January. Uh, you know, maybe six weeks after uh, we saw we first experienced uh, ChatGPT, and what that was was in the inbox, uh, you could do things like automatically summarize a conversation, uh, automatically um, expand upon a piece of text. So if you knew the answer was like no, you're not getting a refund, you could say that, but then you could say please expand and fill in the gaps here. Uh, it, and a few other basic things like you could automatically publish an article or generate an article. And what what we were really targeting there was. How can we take some of the undifferentiated heavy lifting off of the support team to decrease what they would call their average handling time, which is how much effort you have to put in to close a conversation? Uh, and that was a, that release was wildly popular. Thousands of businesses are using it. Um, right after that went out, we started to work on what we believe to be like, how can we produce an end user facing bot that recognizes and answers the most common queries? Now we have like a lot of prior art in this space. We have built resolution bot before. We built numerous chatbots, but uh, the difference with ChatGPT was its judgment was pretty much impeccable, and its knowledge and its ability to articulate and formulate answers was really, really good. The, the biggest effort we had to put in was how can we constrain it so that it stays on topic, it doesn't deviate and start like, offering like political opinions or anything like that. If you you know because brands don't want that, brands want a bot that can just literally be on topic, right? And then separately, how do we make it not make up stuff when it doesn't know the answer? Because the danger of having an end user facing bot that's bullshitting is that the brands won't even know what the question was and the user won't even know that the answer they got was wrong. Uh, so it could cause widespread confusion. So we, so we honestly spent the next while working out what are the guardrails we can put on a bot that would face the end users to keep it on topic and uh, to keep it only speaking when it has high confidence. Uh, keep it trustworthy uh, and, and ultimately like, uh, you know, uh, have a, just a high accuracy, really fast bot. And that culminated in the launch of Finn, which is uh, it's at intercom.com slash Finn. And it's basically, uh, it is chat GPT for customer support. It stays on topic. It talks to you about your own business. It doesn't deviate. And, uh, and we have it in beta at the moment and it's answering like thousands of questions a day. 
and it's doing really, really, really well. We're like really blown away. Some of the stuff it does, like I've seen it push back on users. Someone says, hey, I tried to do blah, and Finn will reply and say, tell me about the exact steps you tried to do. And I'm like, where is this coming from? And then the person like, right, well, I tried to do one, two, three. I'm like, ah, you made a mistake on step two. And I'm there going, where is it? Like, you know, the intelligence is staggering at times. Um, the way Finn works is it learns from your knowledge base. You can give it any amount of URLs. You can say, please read the following 10 sites. And Finn will go and consume all that and, and add that to its knowledge collection. Um, you can also, it'll go and read your entire conversational history of everything your support team have ever said before. And it starts to formulate a kind of a really good understanding, like ultimately a very authoritative understanding of what the hell your business is about. And then it answers questions on your behalf. And, and the resolution rates we've seen are, are frankly staggering. I can't, uh, you know, I, I can't understate that. Like it's, we've seen anything like a high, the highest cases we've seen are like high 70% resolutions. Uh, it's insane. Like just, you know, uh, devastatingly smart. Now, how does that actually translate to good customer support? I think two things I'd say. Um, one is a lot of queries to customer support teams are uh, like what I would call like transactional type queries. Hey, how do I re reset my API key? Or, hey, I'm just curious, about, uh, where's my order or whatever, right? And these are not what I would call brand building opportunities. Or put another way, there are questions where the asker, the customer, uh, they just want an immediate answer. That's all they want. And if you start coming in on, hi, my name's Gabby, please wait a while while I go and type up this response, blah, blah, blah. Even like a 20 second delay uh, isn't really worth it versus like an instant response. So that's one thing, um, which means happier customers because they're getting instant answers to their questions. And then the second piece is, with that reduced workload because of the repetitive questions being taken away, on the high emotion, high urgency, high stress, high complex issues, now the support team actually has the time to get into it and handle it like with a lot more uh, diligence and a lot more care and perhaps empathy, um, depending on the issue, uh, that they just wouldn't have been afforded at a time when it's like close your 60 tickets a day and like, ooh, this one's complicated. I didn't want to do this one. Once, like, you know, once you free them of the shackles of the repetitive work, I think you'll see support teams being a real force for change, a force for good, and a force for like ultimately like happier customers. And uh, and I think that touches on a thing that we see a lot of, which is like Jevons paradox, with the idea being that as something gets more affordable, you tend to do more of it. I think what we'll see is because you don't have to spend so much money on repetitive support work, you'll realize the value of what's left is actually a lot higher, and you'll be tempted to do a lot more of it. So I expect we'll see a rise in proactive support. Uh, rise in like perhaps like more personal support, be that like video chats or whatever. But I think you're, you're going to see a shift towards people saying all of the uh, undifferentiated transactional support volume or most of it is gone. Um, and bear in mind, Finn is going to keep learning and just keep. So like, you know, one vision we have for Finn is the idea that like your support team should answer questions for the first time and the last time. So Finn hasn't seen it before. So it goes through the humans. The humans answer it. Now Finn has seen it. Finn will make sure it never happens again. You know, that type of experience is what, is what we're, we're dead set on building. Um, and then what's left is, I think, the really like the brand building opportunities. The stuff where it's like, hey, I have a really complicated issue. I ordered a bike off. You were arrived. It's damaged. I don't know how to re return it. I'm very annoyed. It's for my son's birthday. That's where they're like, hey, let me jump on a call with you right now. I'm going to trash this out. And we're going to get you set for your son's birthday. Like that's the opportunity where you can actually delight and surprise customers with, with, with it. Uh, but that's only possible in a world where they don't have 65 people asking how they reset an API key. You know, so like, so that that's how I sort of see it all playing out together. Definitely. You know what? Uh, proactive customer support or, or the vision for it spawned a whole new industry of customer success back in the day, right? And so now uh, the technology is there to enable more and more of this. And, and you know, the more customer service people I used to talk to when I was doing... Uh, research for automatically or customer development and i'd ask the question is have you ever been in a situation where your your ceo was getting butchered on social media because of a bad customer service experience and i would reach out to big brands like JetBlue and comcast and like this happens mm -hmm. every day <laughs> because the agents yeah. are inundated because of repetitive support so i'm so glad uh this is being solved now deploying it at scale what are we learning here? What are the key learnings? I think there's a few things. That, uh, like if you're out there thinking, thinking about building on on like a large language model, like off the shelf, be it like OpenAI or Anthropic or Cohere or any of the crew, 
Um, there's a few considerations that are are like new. Uh, one of them is like just around obviously around cost, right? These things are not as cheap to run as like as like sending an SMS by Twilio or something like that. Uh, and what that means is uh, there are features that you have to first ask yourself: Can we afford to do it? And will we, you know, will it make sense? So intercom powers half a billion conversations a month, I think, or at least that figure could be all in the spot, probably more. It would seem like a cool feature to be able to always maintain a running summary of every single conversation, but that would that would probably bankrupt the company if we did that. And it's just, it's a rare muscle for a product manager to have to be a say, hey, things we could build, but we can't afford to in a sense, right? Because yes, it's technically possible, but the value isn't sufficient that we could pass the cost on to the user, nor is it small enough that we could uh, just eat it ourselves. So cost is a huge thing you have to think about. A, a second one that I suspect will fade away over time is just latency. Um, like you, every one of these calls, you are going to a third party and wait, uh, like hanging and waiting for a, a return. Um, obviously, that's still quicker than going to a customer support representative and waiting for them to type the answer. You know, the, the, the bot's still faster. But it makes you think about like what are the right experiences and what are the right order in which to do things. Um, the third one is just around like, and I, I suspect this might go away over time, but like, um, prompting and customizability, I think will become more of an opportunity for differentiation. So what does that mean? Well, right now, oftentimes these, all these bots speak with the same basic tone of voice. Um, and you might want that to be different. So like, um, you know, like you could imagine, take like an online bank, take like an online funeral service, take like an online um, uh, cannabis dispensary, and take like a young girl's fashion brand or some of that. They probably want four different tones of voice. The the room for playfulness, creativity, interesting language is very different in each of those scenarios. Um, and right now, like uh, it does not you know obviously you can prime it by saying please speak like a whatever. But like, I, I think, you know, you, you'll see people invest in differentiated generative experiences uh, through the proxy of tone of voice, bluntness, conciseness, elaboration, whatever. Uh, but I think like these are things you have to think about because a danger might be like uh, you homogenize like, you know, thousands of customers by giving them all the exact same thing. That's not necessarily what you want to do. Now, in Intercom's case, like, We'll we'll follow and end up following the same tone of voice that you've used in your help center articles or in your historical customer support conversations. So there is a kind of natural mimicry there to your business already. Uh, but but these are the things that we're thinking about. Like and then like just if you step one degree up from a high level product strategy perspective, uh, there's a question of um, like people often talk about moats in software, and I generally think that that tends to be overstated unless it's like a network effect or a community or a brand like generally speaking most of the stuff people build can be built by other people like we can all right click and view stores no matter how beautiful your ui is i can work out the css you use to generate it and i can generate my own version of it similarly most SaaS apps are ultimately data in data out i can work out what api calls you're making see what you're doing with the data and probably just build a version of it so put it you know long story short things are pretty easy to copy in our world uh, so I've never really believed in product as a most full stop. However, it's doubly true that if you're outsourcing huge chunks of your functionality to a third party that has a nat natively available, that it's going to be a, a tenuous moat at best. So you have to really ask yourself, where do you differentiate? Uh, I, th and I think um, it'll become harder. Uh, and uh, one positive effect for society might be that software becomes slightly cheaper because of this, because it becomes ultimately easier to build, not just because uh, GPT can go and write code for you, which it can, but also because uh, functionality, like you'll, you'll just have more startups uh, able to do more things uh, competing with each other. And generally speaking, that tends to form a spectrum where you have like, a, you know, the cheap version, the middle version, the expensive version, and the expensive version has a premium brand, top tier service or whatever. The cheap version might be like lighter, but it ultimately it results in like the democratization of software where, where most people can uh, use things so maybe maybe you're not rich enough to afford a sana but maybe you can a, a, afford like the budget version of a sana that doesn't have all the nice typography or maybe not the most beautiful ui separate don't forget our comments about ui going away so that's another like realm of differentiation that, that could be relevant soon but just generally I, I expect we'll see more software and i think that more software will find uh different points on the price curve 
possibly like geo specific stuff or use case or vertical specific stuff. But I just think a lot of things that it wouldn't have been quote unquote worth building will now be worth building because it's easier. Now you advise and invest in a number of startups. How many angel investments you've done? Did I have 50 plus? Maybe it's a hundred plus. I think it's like 90s plus or something like that. I don't know if it's a hundred, um, but it's somewhere around there. Yeah. And being like one of the pioneers in the space, pioneers of chat UI, you're probably getting hit up by a lot of founders. What advice are you sharing with them as they brace for this? Because this is truly a moat building, once in a lifetime moat building opportunity. I think, well, I think it's brand building. Uh, it's, it's, I, sorry, I, I don't know if the moat thing will play out the way everyone wants it to. I, I just, I think what's going to happen is UI is going to get reduced to text input and functionality might get outsourced to open AI. Uh, and like, and the, like, you just can't sell a text area. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, so I, I don't know where the moats will be built. I think brand will be one. I think community will be one. I think network effects. I think, uh, perhaps platform and integration, like interoperability will be a moat. Um, but like, uh, yeah, I anyway, but that said, what's my advice to the portfolio of companies I've invested in? I think, um, they're really like, like the, the assumption of a startup is you can move insanely fast. That's just like, you know, that's like, you know, uh, what it's all about. You literally wouldn't start one if you moved at the same speed as the incumbents you're out to the stroke. And that, you know, there's all sorts of other stuff we can talk about in that, in that regard, but let's just take it as an axiom that startups have to move as fast as they can. And that, that, and that, that speed is a lot faster than the incumbents. What I would say to any startup is basically like, what is your angle attack of attack on the market you're going after? And they'll say, like, oh, we're better UI, better this, better that, better, you know, or more geo, or like we connect better tools, or it's a subtle use case in H order that no one ever saw before, or whatever. And I'd say, okay, well, then what's changed in the landscape so far is I, I do think UIs will fade back to simpler, simpler inputs, text boxes. I do think you can now generate, summarize, expand, collapse, change the tone of text in a very easy way. I think you can answer complex questions, be like given a set of, given a prompt, answer a question. I think OpenAI is very good at that. You can generate visuals, you can generate artwork. Uh, these are all things you can do. So if, um, if your product is like, we're brilliant at sending newsletter campaigns to audiences, what I would say is it's probably a lot easier to pick the right audience in a post GPT world. It's probably a lot easier to generate better artwork in a post GPT world. I'm, I'm personally a bit bearish on the text generation stuff, but like you could probably generate variations of call to actions in a post GPT world. So I'd say everything about your product space has probably changed. Uh, and you need to work out where are the most incisive, uh, like, like, uh, if we define incisive as being most likely to convince somebody to switch to your product, what, what, what's the biggest pain points that you can take, you, like you can take away because you can build faster against open AI or, or anthropic or whatever than the incumbents can. So like if you're going after MailChimp and they say, Oh, the biggest pain in the ass of MailChimp is maybe it's audience selection, maybe it's visuals, whatever you say, right. Well, let's, let's use the new tech, take away the biggest pain point and let's go after their customers and say, we have this tech now. It is true that like the MailChimp or the campaign monitor or whoever in this space will get there, but they might get there in two years. And in these two years, it, it, that's your opportunity to build your brand as like the future of the industry and ultimately to like, to use these two years to create many mother, many other angles of attack such that when they arrive a day late and a dollar short with this feature that you launched, uh, you have like 24 or more of them, you know? Uh, so that, that's really it. It's so, like use speed as, uh, as your strength and your opponent's weakness to use the new technologies to exploit the weaknesses of the incumbent uh, product area um, and profit. Like that, that's the actual plan. I can't be much more descriptive than that without getting into a specific example. Like I need to, like, you know, but like with generally that that's the angle of attack. A lot of folks, um, a lot of startup founders I've spoke to are like, they're very um, okay, but we were halfway through this product sprint. And I kind of get that, which is like, oh, we were building out this beautiful new reporting UI. Does that still matter? Like, honestly, the chances are it probably does, especially if you have customers. So I, I understand the logic or the, the reasoning behind let's finish what we were doing first. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, very soon you should be pivoting towards a AI empowered or infused roadmap because if you're not, someone else is and like it won't be close, you know, 
when I look at like say customer support platforms that don't have a generative AI chatbot like Finn, I'm not sitting here scratching my head going, oh, I wonder what we, which will people pick. They're going to pick the one that resolves most of your common queries immediately. You know, it's, it's it won't be close. So like uh, so I, I do think if you are leading a smaller startup uh, and you're not getting on this and you think you can kind of narrativize your radar by saying, you know what, uh, we don't need AI, you know, we're just a really cute note taking off or whatever. I think you should first ask yourself, are you just lying to yourself to preserve like what might be a difficult conversation? It's okay to go back to your team or your investors, your employees or whatever and say, hey, I'm sorry, but like we happen to have been building product at a once in a generation tectonic shift. And our options are cling on to the past and die or cling on to the future and thrive. I'm choosing the future. And yeah, that means we have to abandon a bit of what work, work we were doing. I, I, you know, I think that that the, those things always seem painful in the moment, but like it's, it's a no brainer when you're the outsider. In this case, when you're me talking to the portfolio company, it's a no brainer for me to say it. I haven't gone through it like within Intercom already. Love that analogy. Cling on to the past and die or cling on to the future and thrive. That is, that is a great way to prove it. And a lot of people, you know, if you see, and this is probably controversial, right, with the AI expert at Google quitting and these letters coming out and saying, uh, you know, it's dangerous. Um, it's going to spawn a bad era for the universe. What is your take? Because there's a lot of controversy also around this. I don't think there's been a single new technology that hasn't produced a shitload of controversy. Like, you can literally go back to, I think, Plato had an issue with the concept of writing. Because he was like, how will people have pure thoughts if they're always expressing them? And what is the nature of knowledge if we can write it down? Like, the radio, the internet, the newspaper, uh, phones. There's not been ever been a new. I, mean, I remember, like, there was like, you know, do you remember like Foursquare and the location checking app? Like, that used to get a lot of bad press because it was like, oh, it's tracking you as you move around the world. So I think, like, one, there has never been uh, like a significant new tech that hasn't gotten, like, you know, a lot of like um, safetyism trolling, for lack of a better word. Uh, but two, I do think this is different. Um, I don't think it's different from a point of view of if you're working on a project management startup, I don't think you're accidentally going to start a nuclear war. I don't think that's likely. But I think um, we're approaching a point where like, and this isn't anything to do with like uh, any of the commercial players. I think the reality is the, the GPT paper by Google is public and large language models are a thing and they have leaked and you can get them and you can train your own. So like really anyone can is now capable of building their own AI. I think like um, things like digital psyop type stuff are a lot more uh, possible now. So like you could probably spawn hundreds of bots to do things in a much more conceivable way than you ever could have before. Um, and you can use things like fake voices and all that sort of stuff. So there'll be a lot of scamming and spamming. I like I think that's really really bad and deconstructive, and we should definitely change our legislation and our laws to make it like a, a properly punishable offense. Uh, in like, and by properly punishable, I mean like carrying a real sentence, similar to like a bank robbery or something. Um, but I, I don't know if I, I really don't. I don't think we should be letting like the potential downsides of this tech uh, limit its potential upsides. I think that's a very pessimistic view to have on society in general. Like when I look at other things that have been happening with ChatGPT, like you know, there is this uh, famous education study by a guy called Benjamin Bloom. He's an Amer American. Uh, pedagogical uh, professor. And he, uh, he produced a study called the Two Sigma Effect, where he said, basically, uh, there is a two standard deviation difference between somebody who's, who's had exposure to mastery coaching one-to-one -one versus somebody sitting in a classroom. Uh, two standard deviations, that's just basically a massive, massive difference, right? And, and then I look at like, you know, I... Whenever I want to know something new that's complicated these days, uh, I go to chat GPT and I ask it and it coaches me through it. And I realized that like we have in a, a massive sense, uh, democratized our capacity for education where we can actually, you can, you can say, where do they go wrong in this, in this like logic equation? And it will correct you. What, what's wrong with this line of code? Why doesn't this compile? Um, where am I making a bad inference in this statement or whatever? What is wrong with this sentence or paragraph of being of written English? Uh, how could you improve it? Like all of that is now possible. And, uh, and whatever with the me's of the world, think about 
about the long, long tail of humanity where like they just they don't even get necessarily great classroom education. And now they actually can get world class education for free. And that's just one little example. There will be applications in medicine, there'll be applications in law, there'll be applications in so many things where like, you know, you ever get a legal contract? Most people can't afford a lawyer to read it. You can now paste it into GPT and be like, can you explain this to me like I'm a like I'm a 20 year old who hasn't studied a lot in their law? Because most of us haven't. You know, uh, so I think the upsides are just so massive that I'm so, so wary of people who only preach to the downside. That said, there will be downsides, there will be shortcomings, there will be like nefarious uses, as there have been for literally everything. But I also just, I don't even think there's an option to like down tools or whatever. Like it would be basically saying, oh, well, I guess we should just give up on advancing society because somebody might use an advancement in the wrong direction. To me, it, that feels like extreme safetyism and is more likely to have like negative repercussions long term. Uh, so that, that, that's kind of my take on it. Just the other day, uh, there was a post on LinkedIn saying, um, complaining about being charged eight to 10K for personal tax fees and saying, hey, we already did the work, but you know they keep upping the fees, lawyers, accountants, they keep the meter running. They don't give you a quote before they're going to move on to the next thing. They talk to you and they charge you. And this changes the dynamic. Like you said, just feed it and get the information you want. No more fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and and like who should I ask? Just get get the get the insight you want, not not the piece of data or the piece of paper or the long winded thing explaining the most complicated way to scare you even further. So I I love this. Now, how can businesses who don't have extensive technical expertise get started? I think the easiest thing I think to like do is work out a way. Assuming you don't have technical expertise, that means you don't have engineers in house or whatever. Um, I think the best thing you can do in the short term is like let your employees expense a like sort of chat GPT plus type thing, uh, so they can actually use this tech and ask them to like identify their own efficiencies in their workflows and uh, how they how do you just you know their their, repetitive, their own repetitive tasks. See if they can get like a significant value from that alone, and I think you will see that. A lot of people are, are like are, uh, how do you say like. A lot of people question that, but I think a lot of people don't also realize how much repetitive tasks they actually have in their day-to-day life. So I think that's like an easy way to sort of test the water is to see, hey, like we're always, you know, at, at the beginning of every whatever it is, like case or project or like, you know, whatever cons- consultant uh, arrangement, we always do the following four things. Let's see if we can prime ChatGPT to do it for us. Uh, we'll give it like the five ingredients and we'll see if it knows how to do it. That's like an easy way to sort of start identify those sort of areas and just get the actual uh, human capital efficiency that's there. Beyond that, I think you'll be looking at, uh, because you can't build it yourself, you'll be looking at off the, off the shelf tooling. So like you might like, you know, if you, if your work involves creating visuals or mood boards, you might want to use tools like say Kive.ai. If your work involves producing uh, branding, you might want to look at Kittle, uh, like a uh, kind of Canva, but that uses, uh, you know, generative AI. Like there are lots of like, uh, off the shelf software you can pay for that will do a lot of your work. Jasper, if you do a lot of writing, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that, that can actually, uh, help your employees again. And then I think after that, you are probably then into we should assess the feasibility of, of hiring a development firm to build uh, against GPT to replicate parts of what our what what our workflow is to see how much efficiency we can actually uh, call back. That's kind of that's the three steps I'd say. Definitely, and and you you talked about leveraging GPT four in Fin. So you guys had access to the OpenAI platform and leveraged some of their libraries or LLMs uh, to build this stuff, right? So you need people with expertise to do this as well. And you know, what's funny is like when we had access to it, I think 2019 or 20, it's basically, it leveraged the Y Combinator network and the network to get all these people. And effectively, I feel like it's all our collective of our data help Mm -hmm. this, help build this thing that is now for the creator uh, good in a way. Um, right. So that's, that's exciting. Um, what are you working on that you're most excited about, you know, maybe things about Finn, things that are yet to be introduced that you can share? I, Finn is number one. Uh, we're like, we're in the late days of the build. So it'll probably be possibly live by the time this goes out. Uh, but yeah, it's like, um, we're very excited about that. I, I think genuinely this is the single biggest 
opportunity uh, we've had to transform the world of customer support and we intend to take it with both hands. Um, so that like, you know, like the, the, the technical features are like, you know, building the inbox import and like learning from prior behavior and interpreting questions in the right way and all that. Like we're building all that uh, at the moment. Um, that, that That's like, honestly, it's at least 80% of my headspace is just Finn, resourcing Finn, bringing Finn to market, adding the right features, getting customer feedback, looking at the resolution rates, all that sort of stuff. But there's huge opportunities beyond in areas like proactive support, even in areas like there's further work we can do in the human support, the agent assist side that we actually have in private beta at the moment, uh, just to make the, the actual humans a lot more efficient as well. Um, and like that's like generally how I'm thinking about it is just we, we believe the, the future of support involves three things, humans, proactive and bots. Uh, we're working across all three and we're basically like leveraging the generative AI to improve all three uh, in different ways. Definitely. Um, where can we follow you? Where are you most active? You're active on LinkedIn. You're active on, you're very active on social, but like maybe give us your handles here. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's just my name, Des Trainer, D-E-S-T-R-A-Y-N-O-R. And I'm probably most active on Twitter and then LinkedIn second. And then like everywhere else I'm there, but like it's, you know, who wants to follow me on like, Instagram or Strava? I don't know, but like I'm there too, you know? Uh, so yeah, Des Trainer is basically what we're at. And then the company is Intercom and obviously it's just Intercom everywhere. You know, I asked I asked Chat GPT to make a witty poem about you, and it says this: "Des <laughs> Des is a witty wordsmith, the master of digital design, a digital myth." It's this is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. do, do you play music? I, I do play music. music yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is this is this is on point. Yeah, this is pretty accurate. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to Des, the digital king, who makes witty remarks. Will make you sing in tech. He's a true visionary in humor. He's a true legendary. That is, good. I asked them a bunch, right? Oh, yeah. and, uh, and they did, uh, they did, they did a great job. Yeah. His passion for design and UX sets Intercom <laughs> apart from the rest. A customer centered yeah. approach with no pre pretense. Yeah. Elevated the company to be amongst the best. Awesome. We'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. That's always a pleasure. This is the third time and it's always been one of the best. Thank you so much. Hope to see you in Dubai the next time you visit or we'll host an mm -hmm. event here and have you come give a keynote. Thank you so much. Cool. Love and peace, my friend. Thank you, Lloyd. Take care. I need some traction.